Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. It's getting towards the end of the year, so it's time for... December. What else? Let's celebrate that by looking at an early MS-DOS laptop, the Amstrad PPC-512. This is actually an 8-bit machine, so even though it looks pretty different from other machines we looked at in this channel, it's actually going to fit right in. We'll first have to get it working and uh, do some light restoration. And if all that goes well, then we'll try some enhancements and maybe some modern accessories. This is probably going to take a couple of episodes, so let's get started. The Amstrad PPC-512 was a portable or luggable, depending on how you look at it, computer released in 1988. It even came with a backpack style bag to emphasize that yes, indeed, this is intended to be carried with you. It does have a lot of pockets to store floppy disks and such, and hey, hey, there's even some disks in here. CD-ROM drivers, which clearly can be from this time, it's even a high-density floppy disk. And some disk labels, those will sure come in handy. Unlike a modern laptop bag, it doesn't have any form of padding, so that's a bit odd. All right, let's take it out of the bag. This was actually a relatively light portable computer for the time. It weighs 4.6 kilograms, which isn't too bad. Amstrad would go on to make other laptops afterwards, like the Alt 386, which would weigh over 7 kilograms. As a reference, I weighed my own cheapy Windows laptop, and it didn't reach 1.3 kilograms. And as a final reference, a top-of-the-line 15-inch MacBook Pro from about five years ago was still only 2 kilograms, so yeah... The Amstrad PPC-512 was really heavy by today's standards. This laptop has a very square military look to it. Unlike modern laptops, the part that folds up is the keyboard, with the screen being in the main body. The keyboard is full size with regular keys, so much better than modern keyboards. And yeah, as you can see, that poor LCD is a goner. So that will be one of the first things I'll have to swap out. The screen pops out of the main body, and you can set it at a variety of angles. Next to it, we have the power button, named as external power or internal battery button. We'll see why in a second. And then a couple wheel controls, one for the volume and the other one for display contrast, I think. This little compartment here, I'm not totally sure. I suspect that's where you would connect the phone cable to the modem, and maybe the compartment itself is to store the cable? Over to the side, it has one double density, not high density, three and a half floppy disk drive. Oh, with a disk still in it. Cool. MS-DOS 3.3. That will come in handy if it's still working. Next to it, there's room for another drive, but this computer only came with one. The handle seems kind of wobbly, so that will be something to fix later on. And then on the back, there are tons of connectors. Power connectors, expansion ports, external video, and of course, parallel and serial ports, like every good machine of the time. And finally, underneath the coup de grave of the machine, a battery compartment. No, no, I don't mean a laptop battery like you're thinking about. It's literally 10 1.5 volt batteries of the hefty type. I think they're like size C or something. This is what you expect to find in a toy, not in a laptop. This confirms my idea that Amstrad intended this as a machine that you can move around, but you'll work plugged in all the time. I wonder how long the computer would run on them. I imagine they just hold the power in the computer if you're changing plugs or if the power goes off momentarily, but not much more. Oh, and also, remember the weights I recorded earlier? That's without including any kind of battery there or an internal laptop battery, whereas a good percentage of the weight of modern computers comes from the batteries themselves, so that makes it even heavier in comparison. Before we open up the laptop, I wanted to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. With PCBWay, you can manufacture your own printed circuit boards for your prototypes and your projects, and you can make awesome Christmas ornaments as well. So go ahead and check out PCBWay.com. It's super easy to upload the Gerber files, and you'll have the PCBs at your house in just a few days. So I think the first thing I'd like to do is to turn it on just to see if it boots up. I'm not sure it's actually working or not. However, I'm concerned about the screen that even if it boots up, we may not see any error messages, but I guess we might as well try it and um, go from there. So in order to connect this, we need to use this power supply, this power connector right there. And that's a DC, regular DC jack. It's center positive, which is the more normal um, thing. And the service manual said it's fine anywhere from 10 to 17 or something. So I'm going to use the bench power supply. And 
I will set it, yeah, 13 volts, 2.2 amps, because the um, the power supply that it came with was up to 2 amps. So I'm like, okay, that seems totally safe. So we'll try that. And then I want to make sure that it's center positive. So red goes there. Okay. And just in case it gets past the BIOS boot up sequence, let's put a an MS-DOS floppy disk. This looks like a Spanish version of MS-DOS 3.3. Okay, so let's listen for any sounds, both in the floppy disk drive and any potential beeps. And yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, that's good. I see 0.6 amps draw. No, oh, floppy disk. So three beeps, floppy disk is going. And God, I'm not seeing anything in the <laughs> the screen. It's not just the camera, I just can't see a thing. And then the floppy disk stopped. Interesting. So we don't even know. I mean, it could be at the DOS prompt right now. Yeah, just type dir, so that's not good. Okay, so what I want to do right now is try to get some kind of video out from this. There are some things that I have planned for later. I still, I'm not sure exactly what, I, what I'm going to do. There's the possibility of using the external video connector. The, there's also the possibility of replacing this with something better. But for now, just to get things working, what I'm going to do is use a replacement screen. So here it is. I actually, I had a donor computer. So this one is really yellow in much worse condition. And I took the screen out of this one. Now notice that this screen is much yellower than this one. And actually the hinges are broken in this one as well. So for now, I'm just going to plug it in like this. If that works, then I'll transfer the LCD to this frame. But for now, let's open it up and just connect this and see if we manage to see something. Just opening up this particular laptop is kind of tricky, as I found out as I opened the donor one. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more slowly than I normally go, just so it serves as a reference for other people trying to um, to open up their Amstrad PPCs. It's the same thing, I believe, with the 512, this one, and the 640. So first, we have some big screws at the bottom. One missing but that's where the donor one will come in handy. So there's two more in the battery compartment. I guess I'll just put this aside for now. And you may think this is enough, but I think, yeah, this part gets stuck. So I believe you have to remove this top cover in order for the bottom to come out which is not the most obvious thing. So now we should be able, I should just remove the disc too. Now we should be able to lift this. There you go. You can see here the ribbon cable that connects the screen. So we still need to remove this. So this is the internal speaker and this, maybe it's an LCD or I'm not sure what this one is. So anyway, we should definitely remove the this board. There's actually two boards in here that contain all the logic and later we'll take them out and look at them. Okay, and there's an edge connector right there. And right, there's those guys as well. There's some plastic, I don't know what the term is, but there are these little um, like plastic screws that the tip flares out when they go through. So you just need to 
push them in a little bit and lift the board like that. There you go. So now we should be able to lift this like that. Yeah, so this board is supposed to have a couple of screws right there and right there, and it doesn't have them. So should fix that. That makes it actually having those makes it uh, opening this up much easier. Maybe I can find some right now. Those do seem like good replacements. Let's see if they work. Perfect. Okay, so this we have several ribbon cables. One is the screen and maybe the other two are the keyboard. So as usual with ribbon cables, you just need to be careful. There you go. And now we need to find a way to connect this and still be able to open up the machine. <laughs> so it turns out this form factor is quite uncomfortable to work with because I was planning on leaving this board open like this, but no, this needs to be fully connected here or otherwise we're definitely not powering it up. And if I do that, I can't bring the ribbon of the screen through here unless I disconnect the cable ribbon. So we may get different beeps and errors if it notices that the keyboard is not plugged in. I don't know. But uh, hopefully we'll get something on the screen. So I've connected the screen there. Now I need to connect the two boards. go like that and I'm gonna try to power it on without closing the whole case okay I'm kind of holding things by hand but hopefully this is enough just to see if the screen works let's see okay we get a line you see that and I'm not seeing anything So the reason we're not getting some video out could be because of those dip switches. I was looking into them and they control what kind of video out we get. As it shows in there, on is down and off is up, which is a little weird, but okay. The first one in the on position turns on the LCD and in the off position, it turns on the external video. The second one toggles between CGA in on and MDA, so monochrome in off. The third one in the on position enables the onboard video and off it disables it completely. I'm not really sure why that is. Maybe so you can add an external video card somehow and maybe you can put an EGA or VGA video card. And then switches four and five together control the type of video. So if they're off is EGA or VGA. So I imagine that means that you're using a separate video card. Off on it's a CGA with 40 columns on off is CGA with 80 columns, and if they're both on is the monochrome with 80 columns. The sixth one is just not used at all, so we can ignore that one. So it really looks like the dip switches are correct. The This way it's on, like it says in that little arrow there. So this means use the LCD, monochrome, um, use the LCD, don't, don't disconnect it, and then that's monochrome mode. So yeah, this should work. I went ahead and turned on the switch here and I just have the power turned off at the bench power supply. So it makes it a lot easier to turn it on and off. So I'm gonna turn it on again. The three beeps, by the way, it seems to be normal. It's just telling us that there's no batteries in the battery compartment. And we're still getting nothing other than that one line in there. So that's normal but we should be seeing things already. So yeah, that's not working. I did try the dip switches in a different way. And what I saw is that when I turned off the LCD, this line would go away. So I believe those are correct. It's just that the LCD is either not working or our connection is not right. So that's really disappointing that we're not getting any video in the um, non-broken LCD. So this is probably not going to help any, but 
I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the LCD that is here and just put this other one in place just to make sure that there isn't anything weird like, oh, we don't get video if the keyboard cables are disconnected or something like that. So I don't expect it to make any difference, but at least we'll be one step closer to what we want. And I won't bother switching the frame, so I'll just put the yellowed one. And once we get it working, I will actually go ahead and swap that because the other one is a lot nicer and wider. So I think this just... Move it to this. There you go. <laughs> I don't want to break it because I'm planning on reusing this frame. There you go. I guess I replugged it in. All right. There you go. Okay, I managed to put the cable through, and now we just need to reconnect them all. Okay. All right, I really don't expect this is gonna make any difference, but might as well. We get the same line in there. Let me see if we can get a better angle. Yep. It looks exactly the same. That's a bummer. I really hope this um, LCD is um, repairable somehow. At this point, I could try continuing by diagnosing the LCD, but it's very difficult to do that because I really don't know what's failing. Maybe the computer is not working at all and that's why it's not putting in a video. Maybe the video generation part is not working, but the computer is working fine. Or maybe the LCD is not working itself. So it gets kind of complicated. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the LCD aside for a second and I'm going to focus on trying to get some video out of this machine just to see if it works. And for that, we're going to turn our attention to the external video port in the back. So like we saw earlier, this is the video out connector, which is a D sub um, with nine pins. And it's a CGA signal. Unfortunately, I don't own any CGA monitors. I don't have any. I really don't have much space, so I can't afford to keep a CGA monitor around. I'd love to. I just you know can't. So that's going to make getting any kind of signal out of this a little bit more complicated, but not all is lost. Looking at the CGA signal specs, things look quite familiar. RGB digital signals, an intensity signal, and a horizontal and vertical sync signals. The video itself is 320 or 640 by 200 resolution and 60 hertz vertical frequency. That sounds quite a lot like some of the other systems that we've seen before, like the video signals from the ZX Spectrum 128K or even the Invest Spectrum. So in theory, it would be pretty simple to create a circuit to convert these digital signals into an RGB signal that can drive a regular TV through a SCART connector. It's a matter of combining the color signals with the intensity signal, adjusting them to the right levels, and combining the horizontal and vertical sync signals into a single one. And here we have a very simple device that does exactly that. It converts a CGA signal into an RGB signal over SCART. I got this one from Serda shop. They actually have a bunch of very interesting expansions and add-ons for um, older PCs mostly. They, I, I've gotten some of their sound cards in the past that connect to a parallel port, for example. Um, we actually may, depending on how far we get with this, in some other episode, we may even get to see that one in action. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble this and let's see if we can display the CGA signal. It's actually a little bit more complicated than I expected. I really thought it was going to be just rerouting the pins and adding some resistances to go from TTL level to SCART levels. There is some other stuff going on in there, which I don't know what it is. Let's actually look at those chips with a microscope. I'm very curious what they are. This is just an OR gate, and it looks like it's used to combine the horizontal and vertical sync signals, although this could probably be done with some resistors and the transistors, but yeah, I guess this is fine. 
This one is some kind of a buffer, maybe to deal with some timing issues, but I'm not really sure. And this one looks like a demultiplexer. I asked Serge from Serta Shop, and he said that it was to implement the brown fix, which means that CGA monitors usually displayed dark yellow as brown, but unless you have this fix, you'll get yellow in modern monitors. Okay, so it's nothing too complicated, and it's the same general idea that we talked about earlier. So assembling this looks very simple. Just need to put those five pieces and I'll start with the smallest one and work my, my way up. Next, we'll put the audio in, which that's surprising audio. I guess you could route the internal beeper here, but it seems a little odd. We certainly won't be needing that but whatever, might as well. Okay, and finally, just the big bulky cart connector. All right, that looks to be everything. Great, let's give it a quick clean. There you go, that looks great. In order to see anything from the external video out, we need to modify the dip switches. So following the table that we made earlier, we need to make sure that dip switch one is off for the external monitor. And then we can set four on five off to get CGA 80 columns. I'm going to use this D sub nine pin cable to uh, connect to the video connector. It's already male to male, so I don't need any gender changers. I plug it in directly to the video card and to the CGA to SCART board on the other end. And then of course I need to connect a SCART table going to the TV. All right, it's all plugged in. And I also remember to add the USB cable to the connector because it's not, it's actually active. It needs to add some extra voltage in there. And let's turn it on. Doesn't look like we're getting anything. Oh, oh, there we go. And this is just a TV. There you go. Wow. The image quality just for the text is great. I guess I wasn't expecting it to see it this good. So this is, this is great. This is the first time we're seeing any video out of, out of this computer. And it's just, it looks like it's just working fine. And the beeping I had read is it's normal. It's probably because of, um, it doesn't have battery and it's just telling us to put the MS-DOS disc. So let's try doing that right now. Wow, this is great. Don't want a new date. There we go. Spanish version, of course. So this is, this is really good news. It looks like it's, it appears to be working except for the LCD. So since it seems to be working, let's test it. At first I thought about picking some old MS-DOS game, but then I remembered I had some files stored away with some programs I had written back then. After some digging, I found several programs from 1989 and 1990 that had been passed from backup to backup since then and I had mostly forgotten about. In particular, I was really happy to see this Return of Frankenstein game that I had made. I remember trying to run it once or twice with DOSBox, but I never managed to get it to work. So that would be awesome if I can get this to run on this computer. The easiest way to transfer files for now would be using a floppy disk. This sounds trivial, except that A, most PCs today don't have floppy disk drives anymore, and B, most of the floppy disk drives are high density and the Amstrad PPC requires double density floppies. Years ago, I got this external USB floppy disk drive that I had read works with double density floppies. I guess we're about to find out. I even found a couple double density floppies among my Amiga disks, so we can try using that one. Amazingly, Windows 10 still retains the MS-DOS command line programs to format disks in double density. You just need to enter format, the drive you want, and specify that it's a 720K disk. This is gonna take a while, so let's speed it up. 
And there you go. It looks like you formatted correctly. So let's copy the files and try them. All right, let's see if the disk works. Oh, very cool. It looks like we can read it fine. Let's launch the return of Frankenstein. That's the one I'm really itching to see. There you go, August 1990. I'm glad I put a date on it. Oh, wow, that's right. It's all coming back to me now. I literally hadn't seen this game in over 30 years, so it's totally bringing me back. As you can see, this is a total copy of isometric games like Night Lore and Alienate. I absolutely love those, so I'm not surprised at all that I wanted to make a game like that. It's really the same thing. Individual square rooms, you only see the walls in the back, you see doors in any wall. Those axes that it's throwing, those remind me a lot of Nightshade. I believe one of the weapons was an axe that was rotating like that. I wonder if I did that on purpose. Oh wow, that idle animation was awesome. So playing through this is pretty fun. The puzzles are really hard, but that's just the mark of an inexperienced game designer. I, I did the same thing in some adventure game that I released on the Amstrad CPC. Most people playing this will probably think there are only four rooms, but there are at least like 15 or 20. No real ending to the game though. It just, there's a loop and there's nothing else to do. Even though I was reasonably proficient in 8086 assembly by this point, I didn't write this in assembly. I actually used a program that lets you edit graphics, rooms, and then some logic and put it all together. I don't remember what the name was. It was you know, some kind of 3D game maker editor thing. So from a technical point of view, this is not particularly impressive, but I'm very impressed with the graphics, even if I say so myself. Back then I had to make everything in games, but I never really focused on making graphics. It does look pretty good, much better than anything I could do today for sure. Okay, let's try something different. I have this one named Bouncing Ball. How original. I remember creating this loading screen in one of the art programs I had. I forget what it was called though. I was pretty impressed that it had this spray feature. So that's why you get the dithering there in the ball. Oh, wow, that's right. I released this as a shareware program, encouraging people to buy the program if they liked it. There were multiple problems with that though. The game wasn't really that good and I never actually released it anywhere. So I never received any generous donations. The game was pretty original though. You had a ball bouncing around the screen and you controlled a cursor that could add or remove blocks that the ball would bounce against. Your goal was to make it so that the ball would collect all the gems on the screen and I think you had to exit through a door or something at the end. I remember I even made multiple levels and everything. Oh, bummer. It looks like it doesn't run in this computer. I wonder if the problem was copying it to the disk. Let me try making another copy and trying it again. Nope, uh, same thing. It almost looks like it's running fine, but the level data is blank. How weird. Anyway, if anybody wants to play with those games, I've put links to them in the description. Just don't send any generous donations to that address because it's not active anymore. So there you go. We didn't get the LCD to work yet, but at least we verified that the machine is working and we made some interesting trip down memory lane looking at those old games of mine from the late 80s. So I hope you enjoyed that first contact with the Amstrad PPC. We'll come back to it next week for another December episode. By the way, if you're interested in this topic, check out the playlist in the description below with links to all the other December videos that people are making. There's some really interesting videos out there. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.